workers or somebody dealing with immigrants and refugees, child sexual abuse, jails, the prison system, um, older people. It was trauma across the spectrum. And it was really amazing to have these conversations with people. But I was struck with the fact that a lot of the work that I've done for 25 years has been the people who are like shrapnel, you know, which we said about crossing the boulevard. It was the people that were flung here, the people that got out, the people who didn't get killed, right? We're seeing it now, right, with Syrians, so many Syrians uh, fleeing that, um, it's like there needs to be this unbelievable cleanup crew all the time for the atrocities that happen on so many levels. So that was a really interesting conference for me to be at. And at the, how many of you are going to the oral history conference in Tampa? Great. Well, at that conference, I'm doing the whole Yomis show as part of the keynote on Saturday night. And I'll tell you something, I was surprised that they wanted Yomis. And I say that because of just like the, the field of oral history and I'm playing with things in so many experimental ways. Um, but uh, the technology allows me now to have the dialogue with people on stage who aren't here. Now you know Tore, right? You know the kids because you heard their tongue twisters. So we have some time for some questions and I just wanted to make sure that we left some time for that. I'll also let you know that I have books and CDs and stuff here for sale if anybody wants them. There's like 19 cuts of multiple sounds and stories on the Crescent Boulevard CD and the books are here too. But does anyone have any questions? Besides that maybe you want a napkin because it's hot in here. Am I the only one that's hot? <laughs> yeah. I was wondering, um, thank you very much. I, I was wondering, um, so much of your work is lived in the books, and, but it does come from interviews. Yes. So how do you, what do you do with those interviews? Are they in an archive somewhere? Do you engage in an archive? Did you hear his question? What do we do with the raw interviews? The eight hours, right, that are still sitting there. Uh, right now, honestly, we're trying to raise money, if anybody knows any funders that we could go to. We have this huge archive of all of the interviews, not just the interviews from Crossing the Boulevard, but a gigantic archive of photographs, hundreds and hundreds of photographs. And some of them are just, you know, like of Manhattan from you know, the Williamsburg Bridge, because, you know, I was driving Warren around, dropping him off at some dangerous corner, going back and picking him up so he could get these shots. But we have tons of photographs. The Queen's Library, the one on Merrick Boulevard, the main library, they have an incredible archive. If any of you are ever doing any research, it's amazing. And the archivist there is amazing. I went there to do another project. They want it. But we need to organize it. And I really just want to raise money to hire somebody to help organize it. Because it's so many photographs. Somebody's going to have to catalog it. Somebody's going to have to organize all those. And, and they want it. So we know we have a home for it. The exhibit eventually is going to be part of the permanent collection at the Queens Museum of Art. But their construction is so slow that they don't have, you know, they've been like got a city grant to that they <laughs> if I live long enough, they'll get it. Um, they, yeah. that, their construction is going so slow. I'm hoping within two years. So yeah, it's going to be somewhere. And if you want to uh, get on our mailing list, just go to earsay.org um, for those of you that have to leave. So yeah, there is an archive, endless amounts of tape. But you know, I, I want to ask a question. Who really listens to art? Who goes into archives? Scholars, right? It's people at universities. Because a lot of my work is about not keeping the interviews in a tight vault. But how am I going to get these stories out publicly in an art form that I think people can engage with? So that's what I've been doing, you know, for most of my life. But I do see the value of the archive. Yeah. 
And it's all digital, so, you know. Yeah, I'm just curious about how your subjects, your narratives, yeah. experience your work, um, you know, and the fact that you're excerpting and hybridizing That's right. their stories. And crafting and recrafting, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, different ways. Uh, the other night, um, three people came from Crossing the Boulevard to the performance at, there were a couple of people there. It was quite interesting. Uh, mostly people are kind of proud, really proud to be part of this because it was such like a exquisite art project. So everybody was really proud to have the book. Bovik always says it's his book. Not that there's 78 other people in it. Uh, and it's interesting for me that people take ownership of it that way. We made a mistake in here, uh, even though we gave uh, Ramon Mapala from the Philippines the uh, spreads and had him read it. There was still a mistake in Tagalog in there. Devastated. So Ninochka, the woman who the mistake is is in, well, it like called me, but she had a sense of humor about it. There's like what thirty different languages. The possibility for error was high. <laughs> it was proofread many many times. Um, so for the most part, people were really happy to and proud to be part of that. The I think I told you like the dialogues I had with some of the older Jews where it got tricky. It's like, I don't want to talk to you if you do this. And so we negotiated that, which also meant that I could never do the character anywhere in a school, in a university, on stage for five minutes that was only funny. I will just never do that, the character. So that became a real, a real relationship. And the woman from Mississippi, was completely, she was in the rehearsal process when we did it at La Mama. She was worried about things that I never would have thought of. She was worried about a story that she told me that I thought was really important. Um, where she said at one point she was being followed by the local sheriff and it, her life was just really turned upside down. She had to leave town eventually, but she said, y'all see those nice mirrors out there on the, on the tree, hanging the way they are? Doesn't it look nice, reflecting the light? Looks like a nice mobile. You know why I put it there? That's to reflect their hate back at them. Mm -hmm. And I think it's working, too. And when I did that story in a rehearsal, she was like, oh, you gotta cut that out. And I said, why? I think it's so interesting that you would create something that you felt like was a barrier. Mm -hmm. And she said, people will think I'm crazy. They'll think I'm a witch. They'll think I'm. And mm -hmm. so we convinced her to let us do it a couple of nights and see how the audience responded. Um, so people often will say things to me that I don't expect. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, that's not, mm -hmm. that's not the story I thought she would have had a hard time with. I thought she was going to have a hard time me revealing that she became bulimic in the process of being a civil rights person and being on the Oprah Winfrey show. And she got really large. And then she thought, well, people will only pay attention to me if I'm thin. And I thought, oh, well, she'll never go for that. And then she thought, no, you have to tell that story. Mm -hmm. You know, those kinds of things have been complicated. Um, and then one person who originally thought that the whole project was about her also, and I think because the English was such a big problem, she, uh, when we showed her the book, she actually like started sobbing because she was just one story in it. So then we ended up talking to her family and we'll have an exhibit. That was really painful for me because I wanted her to appreciate that her story was with all these other people. Um, and Torre, in the, I mean, now that you're asking, the kids have all, the kids that I was uh, representing have all been part of the dialogue uh, as I was developing Yo Miss, because I felt like that was really important, what's going to happen with the show. And Torre, who I sampled, 
there was a period of time, I mean, it's such a good question what you're asking, uh, that he saw a workshop version of the show where I had an actor on stage kind of doing some things and he hated it. And he hated it because it was always getting misdirected and he felt like it was caricature-ish of him. And so I said, well, should we try just recording, recreating our argument and see what happens? And so he decided to do that in the studio. Let's recreate it because now you can do it with Bluetooth. And that was really interesting. And I remember saying to him recently, oh, you hated the way the black male characters were. Including Dave Isay from StoryCorps. Have you listened to some of those pieces or his early stuff? So a lot of people have really been influenced by that. Has anyone here seen the slave narratives or Unchained Memories that was on HBO that Oprah Winfrey did? Um, but the slave narratives are at the Smithsonian. Have you seen them? And I have the CDs and they're really interesting to listen to because they are written out in the vernacular of what, how people spoke. So if somebody was saying, I was, a," uh, that's how it was written, but that's how it sounds. And that the people that did that, there's some complicated things with the slave narratives because who's taking the oral history? Who's listening? Is it a, a person who was not personally connected to anybody who was a former slave? It was the 1930s, there was oral report, there was audio, what a great, amazing gift that people were able to listen to those voices before those people died. Most of the people were in their 90s or hundreds. And so, um, you know, what a great moment to be able to record people and get the stories. If somebody was going to not believe, oh my God, really, your master, you know, put your hand under a rocking chair and rock the chair over your hand? Really? No, that didn't happen. So depending on who was listening to the story, there was uh, a, lot of, a lot written about that project about who was believed, right? Or how much you're going to tell somebody if you feel like you're listened to. If I'm telling you a story and I feel like you just don't believe what I'm saying, I'm gonna mm -hmm. shut it down. And so that, that project was really good for me to read and also just to see like, what are people telling to who? They're always, and that's the thing about oral history and journalism, you know, nobody's completely objective. We're all hearing a story as it hits us in our experience of what we've seen or what we've lived um, and so some stories stay with you in a different way. So I'll, um, well, I think this is very sturdy. I'm going to do uh, a character that was based on oral histories of Holocaust survivors. Is that an airplane? Um, which was one of the first projects I did based on people's stories. Um, isn't that better? <laughs> sort of? Although we have the wrong picture behind us. Oh, well. <laughs> Whatever. Um, wow, that's interesting. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I hate that remote. Um, so, God, you know, when I was 22, I got very interested in listening to older people, and that means people that were in their 80s and 90s. And I didn't have living grandparents, and so perhaps that was some of it, because I think people do projects that are also somehow soulfully driven. There's something in your psyche, in your soul, as an artist that you want to do. You know, it's not arbitrary. Um, is anyone familiar with Mae Sarton's writing? She's a poet. I went and interviewed her. Ooh, she was a tough cookie. Um, and she uh, was probably in her late 70s when I interviewed her. And it was the time of like political correctness in the universities. And she had said to me, you know, um, she was very, very, very controlling of her time. 
she looked at me and she said, what the hell are you going to be able to do? You know, you're so young. Why are you interested in Journal of a Solitude? And so I started talking to her about um, having grown up where my dad died and my grandmother died and all these things happened and I felt like an adult when I was 12. So she kind of talked to me after that. And she was also very, um, at the time she was getting some letters from some uh, lesbians in the, she was a lesbian by the way, she was, um, and she was fairly out about it in a lot of places and she thought that it really hurt her. Uh, she was friends with Eva Le Gallienne. This is like, you know, May Sarton would have been what, like 110 by now maybe or something. And she um, told me that she had gotten some letters from some college students telling her like how she had to identify herself. And it was really interesting to me because she got very angry about it, but she had a sense of humor. She said, well, what are they doing telling me how I should be a lesbian? I'm 78 years old. I, I've been a lesbian all my life. And it, and it was this kind of um, identity politics that was, um, I think there's a brazenness too sometimes when you're young, right? Like this is, this is the way we're going to frame identity politics. And so I told her I wasn't going to do that. I just wanted to know the heart of her story. But you know, having an experience like that when you're 21, 22, where somebody's like throwing everything in your face immediately and not hiding was really instrumental for me. And then I started performing. I was in a company and I started doing some solo shows and I just got interested in creating characters and this character popped out of me that was an older Jewish uh, lady and also some other characters as well. But this one character got really interesting and I talked to somebody from the National Endowment for the Humanities and a scholar that was, I was in New Haven, Connecticut at the time. Is anybody from New Haven or familiar with New Haven? There was a woman that was just starting to do Holocaust interviews at Yale in the 80s. And this was before uh, Spielberg. And I say that because in the culture that we're in, we've seen movies, right? The Holocaust is like a movie. You know, it's, it's been commercialized. It's already in the dialogue of what, <clears throat> I remember telling people, you know, there wasn't any mention of the Holocaust on American television until 1978 as like a real thing, not, you know, in some sitcom or something that, and people go, really, 1978? So it kind of makes sense, right, that in the 80s, a lot of the older people that we approached to interview were, what, why do you want to interview me? Or there are children who were now in their 60s and, and were, why do you want to interview my mother? What are, you, what are you digging around in? And this idea that we really wanted to capture the stories before they died. And I also interviewed a lot of older European Jews. I made a joke in the introduction to crossing the boulevard. And it's not just a joke, it's real. Um, that when I grew up in New Haven, most of my friends were Jewish, Italian, Puerto Rican, and African American. New Haven was um, about, I think, well, the schools were like 85% black when I went to school. So there were very few white people. There was white flight. If people could leave, they left. A lot of black uh, middle class people sent their children to private schools because the schools were so nutty. And um, is anyone familiar with New Haven at all? Like, it's a very funny little town. It's not easy to peg. It's Connecticut. But uh, when I grew up, it was very rough. Like, there was a, a kid with a switchblade at my high school, you know, like, shh, a switchblade. I had it held to my throat. It was the first time I saw a switchblade was when I was 15. But, in the introduction to Crossing the Boulevard, I said that when I was a kid, most of the older people I knew, the grandparents, they were from somewhere else. So I thought that the aging process was developing wrinkles, a stoop, and a foreign accent. <laughs> because everybody's grandparents had accents. And I thought I was going to grow up and have a foreign accent. 
isn't that cool? And it was just a child's like view of what the aging process was. But of course, then I realized now there were particular people, people were from somewhere else. So I started this project, and it was a very long project. It was three years. And somebody in the class here at Columbia asked me earlier about partnerships. That was also a partnership with a housing center, a senior housing center, with um, senior centers in New Haven, and uh, the older people in New Haven represented the demographic of who was in New Haven. So it was older European Jews, Italians, and black Americans from the South that had migrated up, that older group of people, right? So um, I ended up doing this character, and I'm gonna perform a little bit of her, and maybe with some of the story, the kind of story that would have come from someone. It was an amalgam. I guess in the way that Eve Ensler said that she interviewed whatever, 150 people, and sometimes made composites. Um, and then I'll tell you a story about what one of the women from Stanford, Connecticut, who I interviewed, who had survived a camp, and then became on the board of Amnesty International, what she had said to me after our interview, and she almost retracted her interview. So I'm telling you that because this is an audience that's of this work. Mm -hmm. And so I think you might find some of this stuff of the nuance of how to get it like settled in your own body and what's your relationship to people interesting as opposed to just the performance. All right, wait a minute. I'm going to tell you a little story, yeah? Look at you. You know me? Yeah, look at her laughing like that. That's good for you. You jiggle up and down like that. You're going to be very healthy. I read something about it in the book. You laugh a lot. You jiggle up and down. Releases an enzyme in your body. Helps to fight viruses. Yeah? You come see me. You have a cold. You'll feel better, now. Huh? All right. Well, I was going to tell you one little story. Yeah, they asked me what I thought. My grandson, he went to college, very good. Then he went to graduate school, very nice. Then he tells me he's going to graduate school again. <laughs> <laughs> I tell him, how many degrees do you need to have? You're never going to get out of school. Ah, he's going to now, he's going to get a PhD, he's going to do this, he's going to do that, but he's taking a graduate class. All right. And he tells me he has to do some homework. All right. A paper, assignment, I call it homework, all right. <laughs> what does he want to do? He wants to videotape me talking to him about things I have in my apartment. All right. <laughs> so I'm his homework. <laughs> I'm going through everything. He sees the pictures on my dresser. Who's this? What's this? You know, I never knew about this. So he's looking at a photograph of my cousin Mark. He never met. She was a lot older than I am, and you know that's very old, yeah? <laughs> but she's not here anymore, so he wants to know the story. Malke, she was a survivor. She didn't live in a camp and survive a camp. She survived in hiding. I don't know if you know the difference, but there's a difference. But Malke, because she went from one country to another, she spoke five different languages. She didn't know this was just going to help her survive when she was hiding. But when she came to New York, they want her. Why? Because the welfare that's bringing in the new refugees 
they need somebody who can speak a lot of languages because the new people coming from the displaced persons camp, wherever they are, they don't know what language they're speaking. Maybe Russian, maybe Polish, maybe Ukrainian, maybe Russian. I said Russian already, yeah. You <laughs> <are wondering. laughs> yeah. I'm getting a little lost. That's all right, that's what happens in old age. So, she speaks languages. When she was older, in her old age, I tell my grandson, David, she was telling me, Sophie, they're gonna find out. They're gonna find out. Oh my, they're gonna find out. This is what she was repeating. I didn't know maybe she was seen out. What was she saying they're gonna find out? I used to take care of her in her old age. So one day I said, Mark, what is it? Why are you so worried? You're okay here. And this is the story that she told me. I told it to my grandson, and he put it on the camera. Mark, she had a client, right in the welfare department. The lady had survived Auschwitz. She came in and Malka, what she was supposed to do, not that different than today with a refugee, you find an apartment, some place for them to live for three months, and you try and find them something that they can do. But first you find them a place to live. So she finds the lady a place to live in New York City. All right, this is the 1950s. And the next day, the lady comes back to Marka's office. She says, I cannot live in that apartment. I don't know what language she was speaking. I don't remember, but she was hysterical. I cannot live in that building. I cannot live in that building. Marka said, talk to me. She brought her in, she closed the door. And the woman told her she cannot live in that building. Because in that building, there is an incinerator for the garbage. Malka knew the lady wasn't crazy. She had survived Auschwitz. She doesn't want to live in that building. She'll go crazy. So she switched the papers. And she gave her a different apartment. She wasn't supposed to do that. She lied to her supervisor. She didn't tell she switched apartments. She made a special accommodation for the lady. This is what she was worried about her whole life. They were gonna find out she switched apartments. I tell her, Malka, you don't have to worry. The welfare department, they can find something from last week they're not gonna find from 50 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> Look at me a little bit, I came apart in front of you. So, all right, that's what happens in old age. You get to be like an onion, you peel away the skin, and then you cry. <laughs> I don't know. I'll tell you, I told you the story. Do you think I did the right thing by telling my grandson? He's going to show to his college. Are they going to understand? I don't know. Well, you know my grandson? If we took long enough, we'll find out. We're related. Yeah, we'll be tired. You come visit me another day. Next time, I'll tell you a different story. <laughs> yeah. Sure. that lasted for 45 minutes. She had stuff in her bag, she took things out of her bag, explained to the audience who was who. And, you know, I remember um, thinking at the time about, for any of us that write about war stories, there's much more consciousness right now in 2015 than there was even 
15 years ago about uh, what is called PTSD or you could call living with memories of horror, right? With the whole idea of living in a building with an incinerator. Did anybody uh, live in New York long enough to live in buildings when they had incinerators for the garbage? Yeah. Um, I remember that as a little kid visiting my mother's relatives that I was so like, oh my God, they have like, a, you put the garbage down in, it, in the building. Um, so I was thinking about those kinds of stories and how they live with people and we don't know what somebody's living with, right? We don't know what the person is living with who's, you know, working behind the counter, you know, serving people coffee. Um, so that was kind of an interesting lighthouse. That's just uh, one little story within a, a larger range of stories. But the character was always going through a range of humor and pain. Really, really serious stories and, and funny stories. And now I'll tell you the story that the woman asked me about. So she was 90 years old. I had interviewed about probably 65 people, some were Holocaust survivors, some weren't, and she called me and she said, she suddenly got really nervous about what I was gonna do with the stories. And she said, um, I don't want you to use any of my story if it's just gonna be funny. Because, you know, there's a lot of stuff on mainstream television where people kind of, right, that character could be like, a humorous character, and I promised her that I wouldn't. And there have been times while I was performing in theaters where some commercial, more commercial-minded person had come up to me several, this happened over the years, several times, oh, we could take just that one little element of that character and use it for a commercial, or use it for, oh, we love that character, and I would never do it because it would be a total betrayal of my soul, but also of that agreement that I made with her about how is the story going to get used. The other thing that struck me, and I don't know if this is just amount of time you spend with people, but because I grew up in New Haven, there were some people who knew my father, even though he had died when I was a kid, so the line, if we talk long enough, we'll find out we're related. It came from a woman who I actually knew her granddaughters, but I didn't realize it till the third time I had interviewed her, and I saw a picture. And she said, oh, who are you? <laughs> and so it was interesting to me. And then I asked her, oh, I said, that line is really interesting. I think I'd like to use it in a different way. So that character became like a lighthouse, even though people don't use lighthouses this way anymore. It's all satellites. but. Um, <laughs> The way a lighthouse shows you where to go, you know? There's some deep waters here, where am I gonna go? So that character kind of became a lighthouse in terms of the ethics, what I was gonna do, how I was gonna perform, and that balance. I did a show in Stanford, Connecticut for only Holocaust survivors, which would be impossible now because uh, most people are gone, but it was like one of the best and I don't mean best like theatrically, but it was one of the best experiences of my life, uh, theatrically as well, because there was a safety and understanding that we're gonna go back and forth between a horrible story and some humor, because the humor allows us to live. And that taught me something also. There's a limit to how much you can and with distance, you can't have humor. I don't, it's very hard to have humor right when you're in the middle of horror. So that led me to working on a project, believe it or not, in Mississippi. Um, in the 90s, I went down to do some work and I met this woman who was talking about something that had happened there where she had blown the whistle on the cops with, she was white, blonde, blue-haired, uh, blue-eyed, freckles, um, uh, with three black officers and then went down with a, another reporter and we did a documentary where we did both things. It was a theater piece and it was a radio documentary. So we used the theater piece intercut with some of the real people and um, if we could play that. 
and two. it's on that. It's the sound club oh. one with the yellow mm -hmm. thing. And then I'll tell you a little bit about The Real Woman, too, but we'll play just a little bit of it. Because when you're doing a project then for another entity, right? Now this is not just for the theater, it's also going to be for NPR, and so it's going to be couched in their framework. There's another seat up here, too, if people want to sit. Does somebody need a chair? I'm going to make room. Can you hear? As Southern children, we were aware early on that the South was different from other places. And whether we spelled it or said it, M-I-S-S-I-S-S-I-P-P-I. -S 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 -I -P -P -I. We believed Mississippi to be yet another place apart. When I was a child, I heard stories. Mississippi was where it was commonplace for black people to come up missing. We surmised Mississippi had its own laws, and the law was not on our side. But no matter whether it was Carolina, Alabama, or Mississippi, the South was our home. The memories of those bitter times are mixed with an appreciation for the beauty of the South. The greedy kudzu vines, the ancient Spanish oak trees, and the sound of evening freight trains. On horizons today, we'll go to Harrison County, Mississippi, and we'll go back in time to the fall of 1989. Today's program is a doctor drama the story of four deputy sheriffs who brought charges of abuse in a juvenile detention center. Our producers are Laura Seidel and Judith Sloan. Sometimes one event can change the course of a life. That's what interested oral historian and actress Judith Sloan when she met Andrea Gibbs while performing in Mississippi. She was sobbing and begging for help. She said she was being followed and was getting death threats on the phone. I didn't think anyone could make up so many details. Then she told me the entire story. My head was spinning. I knew her fear was real, but I wasn't sure of what to do. I was very naive and I believed that if I did what was right, that other people would follow suit and join in and help. And that it would all like be like this wonderful Cinderella fairy tale where, you know, the wicked stepmother gets in trouble and we all go on to live princess lives. It just didn't happen that way. In 1989, Andrea Gibbs took a job as a deputy sheriff in a juvenile detention center in Harrison County. Four hours into her first shift, Gibbs claimed she witnessed officers beating an inmate, and the beatings continued for the next eight months. Exactly what Gibbs saw is still disputed by many in the county. Fascinated with this tale, Sloan created a play based on Gibbs' pilgrimage in and out of law enforcement. She interviewed Gibbs as well as other key players involved in the story. A dozen supporters applauded the four deputies for finally speaking out. Today, Andrea Gibbs, Tony Lewis, Willie Williams, and Boyce Grayson said they were threatened with their jobs and their lives if they didn't help cover up alleged beatings and abuse at the Harrison. My name is Louise Taylor. I work for the Sun Herald in Biloxi, Mississippi, and I covered the jail beatings saga when it occurred in 1989. 1990. We had the photograph on the front page and they were all in uniform. There were four deputies, boom, 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 sitting at a table in a law office. I always had the impression from the sheriff's department, and I don't know, but that's what really got their good, was the fact that those deputies were wearing in uniform. It wasn't the same effect that if you had four deputy sheriffs sitting up there wearing bell caps and t-shirts. And it was that day, the day that photo ran, that they were fired for violating the chain of command. And my decision to blow the whistle came when I couldn't look myself in the eyes and the mirror. And I realized that because I was silent and didn't say anything, that I may as well have been down the hall beating on the kids just the same as they were. And I became a law enforcement officer because I wanted to use those skills to better my community. And I felt that the only way I could do that was to expose 
and legal activities and the horrors that were going on in the jails. I'm Joe Meadows. I'm the attorney for the African County Board of Supervisors. Uh, they had their own agenda that they had problems with the department that they were going to be fired, likely, for misconduct. And what you've got to do, you've got to go behind the actual time they testified and look at the circumstances leading up to it. My name is Judith Sloan. I portray a character based on Andrea Gibbs. Part of what intrigued me about Andrea was her motivation to become a law enforcement officer. And I knew the play needed to address that motivation. I began to reconstruct her memories. Well, I ran away from home when I was 13 years old. I got locked up in five different states. I was just incorrigible. <laughs> when I finally got myself together three years later, I come back to live with Mom. Hell, I didn't know what to do with myself. After three years of living on the street, all of a sudden I'm, I'm gonna go to high school. I don't think so. Mom went to get her GED, and I thought, well, hell, she could do it, so could I. Then she decided she's going to go to Mississippi Gulf Coast Community College. And I thought, well, hell, if she could do that, so can I. We both decided to major in criminal justice. Mom said it was because we had criminal minds. <laughs> My goal was to work the youth detention center, because I knew how it felt to be on the inside looking out. I knew how it felt when that door slammed shut at night. And I really felt like I could relate to the kids. My name is Kenneth Cole. Everybody calls me Ken. Uh, let's see, I've known Andy uh, approximately 12 years, 13 years, something like that. The first day she, she came home with her uniform, it was it was exciting. And uh, the first couple of days, you know, it was, it was tough being around her because, you know, she was had this air about her. She was walking on clouds. You know, she, she, she was the law, you know. Then she started going through the different training classes, and especially with the, uh, the baton class. I became her practice dummy at home, and uh, she got quite well at it, you know. <laughs> I was thrown in the floor a number of times. I had my badge, my gun, my PR-24. You know the PR-24 is? This here is a PR-24. Now, most of y'all know this as a nightstick, bill club, or a baton, but the official term, I mean, what you learn in criminal justice school is PR-24. When I first heard what PR stood for, it just about died. Public relations. <laughs> this here is a public relations thing. Now, there's very specific rules on how you can or cannot use a PR-24. You see, there's a nerve on the side of your leg. You're supposed to go like this, real fast. That takes them down. You want? And so, um, I'm just going to stop it there, but, you know, I'll certainly give everybody the link. So, it goes on, and she, you learn about her desire to, you know, do the right thing where so this whole idea about um, becoming a cop having been a juvenile in juvenile detention it was interesting to me when I got her to explain about the Billy Club you know because at the time there were so many stories about police brutality and what you can do and chokeholds and so then when she showed me where the nerve was on the side of the leg I was thinking oh I'm gonna show the audience that so that they can see, you know, that people learn where it is, and then people can make up their own mind about whatever they think about that use. Um, so we went back and forth between me doing the character, between the real people, and um, until the story kind of keeps unfolding and it kind of gets more and more dire. But there were hearings in Mississippi in 1994 and they actually, Janet Reno went down, they had these gigantic civil rights hearings about all these deaths that were happening and in the Mississippi jails. So there was some good that came out of it, but same people are still running the jails, you know. Um, I think there were a couple of reporters who went down after Katrina, and I remember calling Andy, this is like years later, because we saw one of the guys that had been in the sheriff's department that had gotten accused of brutalizing an inmate um, and had gotten off. Apparently, after Katrina, there were so many journalists around, this same guy actually got caught again and ended up getting uh, going to jail, I think. It was just kind of wild. Um, so that, that 
show was so intense also for three years we were going down there and one of the things that happened is as we were going through the jails um, how many of you have been in lockdown you know you go inside 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 and the doors keep closing you know it's just like oh my god you know you cannot these were very uh, electronic uh, jails there was a guy in this jail who was painting in a studio. We're walking through the jail and I looked at the sheriff and you know Laura had the microphone on and we were tag teaming and I was like keep rolling you know what the hell is this and um, he was painting portraits and it turned out that he was a really good painter and he was painting portraits of everybody in the town. The mayor, the mayor's wife, their children. <laughs> and he was an undocumented immigrant who got picked up in one of the border states. And I found out that the federal government pays a certain amount of money to house people in the jails. It's like you could stay there for a really long time. And I said, well, surely you're advocating for him since he's such a good prisoner, right? And he said, oh, you know how things are. They move so slowly. And, and it just got weirder and weirder. There were more and more stories like that. The only thing that the civil rights hearings actually caught the sheriff's department in was misuse of budgetary funds because they had Yes, because they had an order for 2,000 frilled toothpicks and those little hot dogs, you know, for, because the sheriff's department was uh, using the prisoners at cocktail parties and using the food, the money for prison food for these cocktail parties for the elite of the town. So that was the only thing they got caught on, right? And so there was just so much corruption. Um, so that story also is the first time I saw immigrant teenagers being warehoused. I thought, whoa, they're just warehoused here. How did that happen? What's the law? And I didn't know. And so I came back. I was working with my friend Camille Massey. Does anybody know her? She's running that International Peace and Justice Center at CUNY Law School now. And she was working for Human Rights First. So I called her and started getting all these details that we, years later, put in the back of Crossing the Boulevard in an immigration timeline of law and policy because they are not citizens. They could be housed indefinitely. There was indefinite detention before 9-11. And in 1996, there was a law that went through that you had to prove credible fear um, in order to get asylum here. And so there was actually a Supreme Court ruling in August of 2001 that said that you couldn't keep people indefinitely in jail for more than six months, but then 9-11 happened and those laws all got superseded by the Patriot Act. So I had been steeped in this kind of stuff before 9-11. And then I started wondering, well, what's going on in Queens? So because there were all those stories in an hour and 15 minute play in a tattletale, this superintendent of the schools, of the alternative schools in New York, asked me if I would come perform in the jails and would I come perform in some of the high schools. And so it was another path into another project. And that's where this came out of, this big, big crossing the boulevard project about new immigrants and refugees who came to Queens from all over the world. Our criteria was they had to have live and or work in Queens. They had to be a character. Uh, for those of you that are doing oral history projects now and you're recording people, it does matter, doesn't it, how people talk and what's the emotion coming out of them of what that's going to be for other people to care about the story. We interviewed over 150 people and included 79 stories because everybody did not make it into this kind of form where the story would be a page turner. Um, and I'll just uh, show you one quick thing that I really appreciate. This woman from Afghanistan, she went to, and the reason is because she went to Colombia. <laughs> graduate school. So she came to the United States when she was 
10 years old with her father after the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, and her father left the mother there. She didn't know the mother at, at all, because the father got two of the older daughters, and there was a baby daughter there. Um, and then eventually, she brought her mother out of Afghanistan into Queens, where they developed a relationship as mother and daughter, as adults. But the mother had lived through the Taliban, lived through, uh, went to Pakistan, and lived in a refugee city for years. And so one of the things that Shikaba told me was that she had to teach her mother how to cross the road. So I say that because it seems like a mundane thing, doesn't it? You know, but she had to teach her mother. This is like a, a 13 lane highway here at Queens Boulevard. Um, but one of the things Shakeva said here was, I've had people assume that I'm anything from Greek to Italian to Native American, maybe even Hindu, but very few people ever guess that I'm an Afghan. So I can sit there like a chameleon and hear what people have to say. I was in an environment where somebody said, we should just go nuke Afghanistan. They blew up the Twin Towers, so let's get rid of them. I sit there thinking, well, we didn't do it. Does 19 hijackers weren't Afghan at all. I grew up like a lot of people in my generation in Kabul as a secular Muslim. But now, after 9-11, I want to know, what does it say in the Quran about jihad? What does it say about the role of women? What does it say about how to be with your neighbor? I know I'm not going to find anything that says that you can go blow up people. My kids are going to be quarter Jewish, quarter Christian, and half Muslim. Think about that. When they come home and they say, oh, mommy, somebody said Islam is a violent religion, I've got to fully be able to explain Islam to them because I don't want my children to learn Islam from somebody else. So, you know, she had this very unusual uh, path. She married a man who was half Jewish, and then in the book she kind of talks about how his father was afraid that she, he said to his son, aren't you afraid? She's Muslim. You know, she'll kill you in the middle of the night, right? <laughs> the father is saying this. And then the son said to the father, well, you married somebody who was German. So, um, <laughs> you know, when we met Shikaba, we didn't know she was married to somebody who was half Jewish. But she started, her story kept pouring out. And it was one thing after another. And she had many, many ironies, like, she did all the paperwork for her aunt to get here from Pakistan. And the day that her aunt was flying was on 9-11. And the plane was told to turn around and go back. And if any of you have done an immigration mm -hmm. hearing, or anybody's done a case, this is like seven years of paperwork. And she had to start all over again, not to mention that the aunt was still there by herself. So there were so many stories like this of resilience and coming back, going forward. Um, if there's time during the, the Q&A, I will play you a little bit of Bovik Antosi, who fled on a cargo flight from the former Democratic, <coughs> from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. He was he had two identity papers, and he ended up uh, fleeing. And he lost his wife, his daughter, and his livelihood, and ended up on a cargo flight in the dark, not knowing where he was going. But the Russian pilot told him that you're going to JFK. And so, um, you know, this kind of thing. Of, and then he landed at the, what, there used to be an, an INS detention center next to JFK. And he um, spent two years there. No access to outside light. I was performing at Bedford Hills Women's Prison, and I was sharing this story and some audio. And um, one of the prisoners said, oh, well, I know why it's legal to keep him in 24 hours with no, all of them, you know, all the immigrants in there 24 hours. And I said, why? But she said, because he's not a citizen. And, he doesn't have the right to habeas corpus. And so it was interesting to me that the women in prison knew all of the legal stuff of why it was OK for the US government to keep people without, because they had access to an hour of exercise. He didn't. And so um, at the end, he says this really 
kind of amazing thing, even though he came out with nothing. I'm going to thank God every day that I did meet so many friends inside that nightmare place from Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Santo Domingo, from all over the world. I'm going to sing, even though I cannot sing very good because there's no rule on me that I cannot sing. <laughs> a guard cannot take me to the clinic like I'm a crazy person, say there's something wrong with me singing in the dormitory. I'm going to sing on my bed. I'm going to sing when I'm washing. I'm going to sing walking on the street. If I meet someone new to this country, I'm going to give them the hospitality that I did not receive, welcoming the people coming. I'm going to correct more the accent of my English that I do have. I'm going to get a job in my field. And so it was really amazing. Then he said, I, I'm going to enjoy the life now because I have the human right now. I have the right now. So that was kind of the end of his story. Um, while he awaits his engineering certification, certification, he works as a receptionist at a youth hostel, welcoming people from all parts of the globe. He was working at that hostel on Amsterdam Avenue, um, which is ironic that he did not get a very good welcome coming in. And when, when I was working for lawyers, it was the Lawyers Committee for Human Rights, this case had come up. And there was a hunger strike. For those of you that have been in New York for a long time, you may remember reading about this in 1999. There was a hunger strike at the uh, Wackenhut Detention Center and Bovik was instrumental in that. They almost didn't take his case because it had gotten botched by his previous lawyer. And his previous lawyer was just taking money from the brother in England and not doing anything. So we came across a lot of stories like that where you start seeing how vulnerable people are when you need something. I'm going to um, switch gears just a little bit and make sure that I can uh, show you bunches of different projects. So Crossing the Boulevard ended up being an exhibit. It ended up being a uh, performance, a book, a series of radio documentaries, <coughs> and um, is that on? I'll just show you a little bit of it. It's a very, very big road. It's like a like 12 thirds of lanes over there. It's okay for my age, I can run. But let's say like the age should just walk one leg to another leg. It's really dangerous. Turkish. 
And then uh, I'll just show you just a teeny bit of this. So in the performance, there's always images of the person behind, even if it's a multi-ethnic cast, and if there are many different people in it. Whether I'm doing it or someone else is, you always see the person. before you, I pray for a shield over every one of them. I pray for all the children of this church. You will give them wisdom and understanding. They will be great and they will not be pushed into the subway track. You will shield them from bullets and police that misunderstand who they really are. Oh Lord, let no guns come near them. Let no gunshot come near them. I praise you for what you have done. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Um, I just wanted to do a little of her because um, it was one of the things that I realized when we were in the Nigerian church. She was praying that the people in her church not get shot. She was in the Polish church. You know, we would sit for hours in people's churches and in mosques and in temples. And um, she, was, she started talking a lot about what happened in that neighborhood in Far Rockaway. Uh, and we interviewed several people from her church who talked a lot about coming here to the United States from West Africa where everybody was black and then coming to New York and having confusion about black Americans and that disconnect between black immigrants and black Americans until they started feeling like they were black here. Because what she said to us is in Nigeria, um, there's Yoruba, Igbo, and Hausa, and maybe a couple of a uh, dozen other tribes. And so at one point she said, uh, most of the congregation don't know where I'm from. They think I'm Yoruba. Really, I'm from a small tribe in the middle Delta. And then she wears three different kinds of dresses each week. You know, one week I wear the Yoruba dress, next week I wear the dress of the Igbo, next week I wear the dress of the house. And she started doing that on purpose because what she said to us is, look, if you go to Nigeria and you are from Iowa and I'm from New York and you're from Michigan, once we get to Nigeria, we're all from the U.S. And she said it's the same thing here. If we're not Nigerian, we're all these different tribes. But once we get to New York, we're all Nigerian in terms of the way they're seen and how the community survives. Um, we could turn the light on. And let me ask you, I was going to show you one more clip from uh, a new piece where you'll kind of see the trajectory. And if there's time, I was going to show you a little bit of a symphony and then take questions. Do we have the window? Are people hot? I see a few people doing this in the back. Um, so if the windows are open, uh, that would be great. Or maybe I could open this door, too. We'll get some more air in here. That's OK. Um, but we'll get some air. I think what I'll do is stand on the chair and can we switch to this one now? Yeah. Great. So how many guests are here? You're not a Columbia graduate student. Okay. And how many Columbia graduate students are here? So a lot of you are doing interviews, right? And you're, uh, I don't know what your projects are like, but one of the things for me as an audio artist, because that's my, my real specialty, is working with audio. And I love the sounds of people's voices. And what's the music of the story that they're telling? What are the sounds outside that are going to be embedded? Um, and so. I kept using all that stuff, and that led me to want to use a mix of live audio. How am I going to do these very tight audio mixes that are like for radio and do it on stage? <laughs> That's what I was trying to figure out. And it took me about five years to figure out how to blend all this stuff um, about stories in jails. Now we've got this on, right? Yeah. You want to Great. Right. Um, no, I got it. And then the technology kind of 
caught up with me because um, <laughs> It's great, right? Because I could use I could use little wireless devices to trigger things where I didn't have to have it on my body. I could use foot pedals. I have a keyboard. I'm also playing keyboards in this show. Here's a story about a girl, a boy, a child, a grandmother, a teacher, a student. Nine-year-old. There's a 12-year-old, 18-year-old, 16-year-old, 48-year-old, Brazil, Ireland, woman, man, Nigeria, girl, boy Venezuela, from Togo, Africa, Mexico, China, Honduras, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Yemen, Bosnia, Haiti, Poland, Egypt. A story. Here's a story about a girl, a boy, a child, a grandmother, a teacher, a woman, an uncle, man child, a girl child. There's a nine-year-old daughter, 16-year-old brother, 48-year-old grandmother from Dushanbe, Brooklyn, Kathmandu, Queens, Harlem, New Buffalo, Haven, Buffalo, Lincoln, waiting, looking, listening, longing. Who we'll changed to? Oops, no. That happens sometimes too. Change to <laughs> waiting, looking, listening, longing. Mm -hmm. Waiting, waiting, waiting for papers, waiting, waiting for immigration, waiting for the answer, waiting, waiting for the answer from the papers that were filed yeah. with INS. Change to BCIS. Yeah. Change to USCIS. Yeah. Change to Homeland Security. The government, the agency, the agent in Nevada, New York, New Hampshire. It's a post office. Not on a chair, I would turn all the way around. An address somewhere else. Yeah. What's the answer? Her status from the SATs, ELAs, GREs. What's her status? What's your, your status? status? In the country, out of the country, her mother, father, sister, brother want to go back. Go back. She wants to go back. go back. Can't go. Can't get back in. Can't stay. Should she go? Should she stay? Should she go? In the show. There's a woman, a man, a girl, a boy, in high school, in college, wondering if maybe she should leave. Maybe go, maybe yeah. stay, maybe leave. Looking and maybe longing leave. and waiting to find somewhere Lady. that's home. Nowhere to go back to. Nowhere looking to go and back longing to. and waiting to find waiting somewhere to find that's home. home. So that was you know, something I wanted to do where I was mixing uh, commentaries that were airing on the radio and I wanted to do it live with voices but then I also wanted to show what it was like being in kind of this uh, very chaotic uh, school environment in New York City so uh, skip the scene go to a few more places and we're outside and I tell the audience I have to dash I have to direct a project for immigrant teenagers a rehearsal. I get there, not one of them has their lines memorized. Half of them are running around the room playing games. There's going to be a performance in two weeks. They're all new English learners. They don't have their lines memorized. You don't understand. I tell them, you are driving me up the wall. They look up the wall to see what's there. <laughs> I tell them, it's an expression. I tell them explaining expressions is like opening a can of worms. Two of the girls scream out loud. Ah! <laughs> the kids take everything literally. Note to self, explaining expressions is like opening a Pandora's box. At least there's hope at the bottom. And then uh, I lie down on the floor with the kids because they're exhausted, I'm exhausted. Um, we skip the scene. They start telling me that they're exhausted from having to speak English all day long. Mm -hmm. So one of the girls says to me, um, when I talk in English, I have to use so much energy of me. I never looked at it that way, mm -hmm. right? In your language, you don't have to think. But when you use English words, you have to think and talk. So it's like two kinds of energy using. So I thought that was really interesting that, well, what does that mean? I'm pushing them to do something that's my agenda, and they're tired. All right. So I tell them to uh, sing in their own languages, whatever they want. Let me just... Don't bash my car. And a boy from Nigeria starts singing a song. Tony, you don't hit my car. Can you hear that back there? I'm used to, like, speakers.
The girls start showing us a clap again. Some other girls start stepping. I got an idea. What about tongue twisters in your own languages? They're brilliant. They're relaxed. You know this one? I record them one at a time. I got an idea. I'm going to take all of these tracks home. I'm going to mix them into one big track and we can do a movement piece and your own languages will be the soundscape. You won't have to speak English. And then on the stage there's different areas and there's a little keyboard and a sound booth station and I go home and the light shift and so you always know that when I'm over there that's my home studio. And I mix this stuff into a track. I'm so proud of myself. You hear it? Kids are going to be so happy. I play that for this hip hop engineer that I work with, Tore. He says, That's cool. It's like hip hop. <laughs> Listen to the last part that he says. That's cool. It's like hip hop. I'm going to sample that. I tell him, you can't sample that. You don't even know the kids. And I already made that track that's like stealing. He says, It's not stealing. It's recreating. What you're doing is like hip hop. Uh-uh. I'm not, what I'm doing has nothing to do with hip hop. See, I just record original sounds that I find myself, and then I make beats out of that. And then I'm not sampling like Sly and the Family Stone, who finally got paid, or the Beatles, or James Brown. <laughs> Plus, a lot of hip hop is, you know, Guys with big egos. You know, guys surrounded by half naked women to sell music. I asked her, what's the difference between using half naked women to sell music and a corporation using a half naked woman to sell a car? He says, You don't know about the history, it's a whole culture. Hip hop is an art form that grew up out of the fires in the Bronx and came into the light when there was a blackout in New York City in 1977. 1977. This was just the way Yogi made something out of nothing. Born out of desperation. Born, Born out, out of, of desperation. desperation. I can relate to that. Then he says, We, we need, need to go, go to, to the Rock the Bells, Bells concert. Hell yeah! Why? Here's the lineup Ghostface, Method Man, Q Tip, and a tribe called Quest. I wonder why he named himself Q Tip. Oh, <laughs> my boy. The mortal Technique. I never heard of a Mortal Technique, so I went to the Rock the Bells concert, and I hear a Mortal Technique. And then the next scene is just like so loud, you can barely stand it, and I go to the Rock the Bells concert. It's not going to be that loud here. There's somebody making it. Nice. It makes the hood in America look like paradise. Wow. To He's Asia rapping about US foreign policy. Kind of. I never really heard a rapper do that. Some people and try to keep it quiet and spend the next 25 years trying to deny it. Uh, for where they cut your hands off if you make a fist and niggas throw coke out because the job. Uh, <laughs> He's rapping about the kids and the families I work with. How did I get here? And then the rest of the play is really like, how did I get here? How did this seemingly, you know, who am I, this middle-aged Jewish lady in a Rock the Bells concert, collaborating with this hip-hop artist, it's a little odd, right? And uh, working with refugees and immigrants, and you'll all get this, um, I, I run into a superintendent in the New York City schools, and she says, hi, my name is Louise Lindblad. Judith, I saw your show about the teenage runaway turned deputy sheriff who blew the whistle on police brutality. You remember that, Mississippi? <laughs> your characters are wonderful. I run all of the programs in New York City for the alternative schools. These kids are a hair's breadth away from going to jail, and you would fit right in. <laughs> I mean, your characters are wonderful. 
<laughs> okay, cool. So I do need the money. I decide to uh, do this, you know. I'm going to go off the road and I'm going to work in the schools. And Louise walks me through the fingerprinting process at the New York City Board of Education. The woman behind the desk tells me it's going to take three months to get my fingerprints back. Why so long? First, we have to log your prints. <laughs> <laughs> then we send them to the FBI. <laughs> then we get them back in a week and then we sit on them for three months. <laughs> oh, that makes sense. <laughs> I'm filling out a form in blue ink that is so light I can barely read it. There is a space for my date of birth, and then there's a box that says DOD. What's that for? That's for your date of death. <laughs> <laughs> Great. If I work for the New York City Board of Education, I get to choose my date of death. <laughs> a little perk. And um, so I'm going to stop it there, but I am going to tell you that as the play goes on, these things get revealed in the way that your interviews people reveal themselves over time, right? They tell you something at the beginning, and then you go back the next time, and they tell you something else. And the more you get to know people, the more it gets revealed. So the play is structured like that. The girl that says, when I talk in English, she comes back. The kids, uh, the story about starting on 9-11 comes back. And it becomes clear that their lives are forever changed. Somebody's mother can't get here, you know, because she came before it. How long is it now going to take? Somebody from Egypt, the boy says, it was always my dream to become a pilot, not a normal pilot, something exciting like a war pilot. Now, the war is against the Muslim people, so I've changed a little bit my plans. <laughs> <laughs> now all I want to be is a mechanic for airplanes. So you start seeing, like, the choices that the kids are making as the country's changing. And then as the play goes on, uh, the old lady, I brought the character back because this is based on a true story. A principal at one of the schools had seen me do that character somewhere else. And um, he wanted me to do the character in his school. We brought a bunch of kids to another school. In New York, things get heightened. And you know, this is what I'm a little concerned about when things go around the web. You know, they can go really fast. And it can be misinformation that goes really fast. So there was a hate crime in Queens uh, at a particular high school. And everybody immediately, what do you think when you see, hear hate crime? It's like black and white usually. A Muslim kid from Pakistan, get this one, this is Queens, had cut off the ponytail of a Sikh kid from India. <laughs> it was very, very serious. And there was tension in his school between the Chinese kids and the Tibetan kids, the Bukharan Jewish kids from Tajikistan and the Muslim kids from Afghanistan, the black Americans and the black immigrants. So all the border countries. So this principal asked me to perform my Jewish grandmother character because he had seen me do a story where the character has dinner with a Palestinian family. And the granddaughter comes back and comes back with a snapshot, and the old lady says, you look at the grandma of that family, you look at me, the way we look, we look like sisters. And we're supposed to want to kill each other. And then she says a couple of other things, and at the end of that pass, I say, I was nervous about sticking my neck out. I thought everyone was going to make fun of the character and see some old Jewish lady. Instead, the kids told me they saw their own grandma. Another day, another lesson. So as the play goes on, Immortal Technique actually comes to visit my class. It's a whole other thing. And <laughs> does anybody know him? I mean, he's like a rough guy. And, um, and then Torre comes back also at the end. The, That's cool, it's like hip hop, I'm gonna sample that. Because as the play gets revealed, and I'm not telling you anything that's going to like, if you want to come see it, this is not going to mess it up for you, trust me. But I lived through two deaths and a fire by the time I was 15. So when people look at me, they're not thinking that. Do you know what I mean? They're not, oh, yeah, single mother brought her up. 
because of our stereotypes of who people are. And so I tell the kids because they ask me, and then they want to know how do you overcome that. And the more I reveal a few little things with kids, the more they ask things, and the more they share things that I don't expect. And so those relationships kind of unfold in the play. And um, you know, some fairly heavy stories that I wouldn't do in a room on a chair. But with lights and in a theater, it works just fine. And by the end, Torrey comes back and he says, you know, fires in the Bronx. And I say, fires in my family. Blackout in New York City, lights out in my head. Because I was doing a little parallel of growing up in New Haven, living through those deaths and fire, and then the idea of fire in my family. My grandmother's family all got killed in the Holocaust. What was I doing when I was 20, interviewing all these Holocaust survivors? I used to say that it had nothing to do with me, by the way. I thought I'd share that with you. And, uh, and then as I got older, I started having to deal with my own memory of that event, of her dying in, in our house. Uh, because she took her own life, and so it was very, very heavy, and very heavy that that legacy was in my family. And so the circumstances were tragic. And so for years, I think I did what a lot of the kids that I work with do, is they think it means something about them, because kids do that, right? Oh, I can't tell this story because it means something about me. And I felt that way. So it's been um, kind of a tool, actually, and been an interesting thing for me to now be giving advice. Well, yeah? Uh, was Mayor Dick Lee a good influence on the New Haven in the 1960s? <laughs> <laughs> Dick Lee, was he the mayor in the 60s? I wouldn't have been paying attention in the 60s. I was too young. But I, who was the mayor in the 70s? in New Haven. I would have been more aware of whoever was there, like, later. Were you in New Haven? Yes. Ah. You're not Dick Lee, are you? Yes. is a group that's in Brooklyn, and I uh, didn't necessarily work with them directly, but I worked with Susan, who, Susan Perlstein, who started it, and she's the chair, she's on our board, she's not the chair, but she's on our board, and we partnered with Elder Share of the Arts for our original funding for this, so they... Well, I actually was glad we got your proposal because I was on the Rockefeller. Oh, you were? <laughs> You were on that PACT grant panel? I was on the PACT panel, and I was the only one. I said, I'm not leaving this room until that program is funded and fully funded for that few years. So I feel proud of that. Oh, my <laughs> God. Thank you. Were people arguing with you? Or? Well, no, but everybody has their picks. They have their picks? Thank you so much. Yeah, we partnered with her, and she... Um, Elder Share the Arts ended up sending us to this senior center where they had a project going, and that was another thing that we realized was really unusual in this yeah. project, that what's it like coming to the United States when you're 65 years old for the first time and you speak no English? And that was, Susan was instrumental in leading us to this um, unbelievable senior center in Flushing, Queens, which ironically was getting renovated at the time, and so they had to share it with a Jewish senior center, and we hosted storytelling yeah. workshops yeah. there, and it apparently people had never sat together before. The Chinese people sat there, the Jewish people sat, and we went and we did a storytelling workshop, we had them all sitting together. And this woman said, I've never talked to them before. <laughs> and then it turned out this one woman at a different senior center, she was 65 when she came here, 
She didn't speak any English, but she learned English from her tutor, Frank, who was older than her. And he was Jewish, and they, uh, she realizes they have a lot in common. They ended up getting married. And she told us that she <laughs> was making, she cooked. It was very traditional sex role stereotype marriage. And she did all the cooking. And we think, we have a footnote in here, because we put footnotes of like people's stories, that Frank is the only Jewish man in New York who doesn't like Chinese food. <laughs> he married her. <laughs> and then she says in here, she says, little by little, I put Chinese ingredients in the matzo ball soup. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't know. <laughs> It just was so funny that he didn't like Chinese food, so she learned how to cook all the Jewish food. But, she, but you know, this was such an amazing thing for us because, like, wow, I hadn't thought about that because most of the immigration stories that you hear are about young people and or adults. But thank you so much. So the power of a single person on a panel is huge. Thank you. Thank you so much. That packed there. Thank you so much. So we got a Rockefeller grant for three years, and it was fully funded. And we used the money to hire translators. Then we got a Ford Foundation grant. We did raise a lot of money for this project, and it needed it. And we also wanted to make sure that the book, that everything was really well done. We didn't want to have a book about new immigrant stories where it would be like Jacob Reese or it'd be like, oh, and now here's this person in a basement apartment. We wanted everybody to just look at their face. Warren wanted to do it against white so that you're just always, so he could design around it, but also they're just looking at you. And we realize that when you interview somebody, the backdrop falls away. You actually don't look at the background when you're just looking at their eyes. So he wanted to recreate that experience in the book visually. Um, wow, thank you. Well, if anybody knows of any other funders that would be <laughs> interested in helping us now move this into I think the thing about archiving is that you want to make sure that people will be able to find everything. Yeah. And so the Columbia archive is open to the public. Is open to the public. Yeah. yeah. And we've had, you know, all kinds of wonderful artists and playwrights and you know, filmmakers come and listen, sit and listen. Actors to know, stories. Stories and read stories and to try to hear the voice. It's amazing, right? And you need to do it. Because I listened to all of these stories. Like that was one thing Ramon, this guy from the Philippines said, I was doing Ninochka the other night, um, where she says, I wasn't afraid of being outspoken. When you're like that, you walk into trouble. When they arrested me, they brought me to the Philippine Constabulary, and they booked, fingerprinted, and searched me. The colonel said, do you know that in a list of 5,000 enemies of the state to be picked up, your number only had two digits? I said, first 100. I'm so honored. And so Ramon said, oh, wow, you really have Ninochka. And it's because I listened to her voice for so many hours editing. For those of you that are recording people, you're just sitting there transcribing and then oh do I like that do I want to and you know just got into my brain and my body so that was kind of fun you had a question yeah I just wanted to add another place in New York City that you can go to to hear people's um, uh, stories and that's um, the theater for the oppressed mm -hmm. I don't know if you're aware of it but they did something called housing circle circus housing circus which is the circus that people who are trying to get benefits have to go through. <laughs> How they have to act when they see their, um, this officer, that doctor, and this psychiatrist, you know, it's a circus. And, and where is the archive? Uh, no, it's actual performances. Oh, performances. Performances, oh, okay. yes. And I just want to thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Um, 
And I just want to say also that I'm, I also do some people's stories. And I do it on a theme. I interviewed survivors. And after they came here, they really thrived. And it really mattered whether you were seven years old and a rock was being thrown on at you, or whether you came before the war and your two parents were big mockers. And you became a big mocker. So where you are on the wheel of life really uh, is important. And so they they survived and they thrived. They all had somebody to say thank you to. The next year, I interviewed nine people and asked them, what are you thankful for? So you can do this, this kind of thing on a theme. A hundred and nine year, a hundred and three-year-old woman was thankful that when she came to America, she got a job as a nanny. And she was able to get the paperwork to get her parents out of Nazi Germany. And a little 12-year-old was thankful that when a classmate died, her mom taught her about mourning. And this year, I'm doing it on, so you survived, you thrived, you're thankful. So what is your hand on the planet? What are you doing that you don't get paid for? that you love to do, and why do you do it? And I got 10 people, age 11 to 91, and the 91-year-old moved here to be a, an actor from Pittsburgh, where he was black, and they just gave him shit rolls, and he moves to, a, and this is the end, he moves to a park, and there's a gang there, a gang of high school dropouts with nothing to do, and he uses his acting skills, and he turns that gang into a youth group. He turned them around 180 degrees. There are people living today who have changed their lives because of this one man. And he's going to be at the Hebrew Tabernacle Gold Ring on November 22nd for an interfaith Thanksgiving celebration. I invite you all to come and I'll put up some uh, flyers. And uh, we need to know each other's stories. We need to walk in each other's shoes. Thank Great. you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, thank you. Also, I'll let you know that if you are around in uh, October, October 24th, I'm going to be doing Yo Miss at the New York Poets Cafe. And there's an opening act of uh, group of women who are doing stories about um, having gotten out of prison. It's really more about their stories of what their lives have been like uh, being out of prison and they're doing an opening act. And I do have flyers for that here. But you can certainly uh, grab a card and take that. And I just want to thank, I know I'm still standing on this ridiculous chair, <laughs> but I just feel like it's a little easier no, to talk to people. Um, I want to thank Amy so much for having me here in this space and also for this incredible class. And I know you're all doing interviews right now. Um, my only thing, because you had asked me, you said that people were right in the middle of your, your mm -hmm. pre-production, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Is that for me, when I'm listening and I'm recording people, I just really have to slow down mm -hmm. and listen really carefully to the language and the nuance of what people are saying. So you're not yet at that part of the semester where you're in post-production or right, you're, you're interviewing people. So, um, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask me or email me future. Thank you so much.